Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's 2018 Spring Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar. Hemlock, Woolly Adelgid, and Biocontrol Efforts, which is presented by Dr. Mark Whitmore. Mark is a forest entomologist in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University. He started his career at the University of Washington, studying the natural enemies of spruce beetles in Alaska. He then studied at UC Berkeley, focusing on biological control of forest pests, researching parasitoids of pine bark beetles. Since joining Cornell in 1989, he has been working with professional land managers, state and federal agencies, local government officials, and concerned citizens to help them understand the issues and strategies for minimizing the impact of non-native invasive insects such as emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid. Mark is currently the director of the New York State Hemlock Initiative and the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Biocontrol Research Lab at Cornell. Before we get started, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will be making note of all the questions and Mark will have time to respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope that you will take the time to fill out. And if you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to amystone at stone.91 at osu.edu. You'll also be receiving these instructions in your email. So certificates will be emailed to you within a week of today's program. <clears throat> Excuse me, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing very soon at wwwemerald info You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today, and Mark, take it away. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Robin? Does yes, I can. You okay, sound great. Sounds good. Thank you. Can I get one of those goodie bags? Um, mm, okay, I guess so. <laughs> you per, oh. You've earned it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not yet. I still have to talk to myself for an hour here, it seems. Anyway, hello, everybody. It's really uh, an honor to be here uh, with you this afternoon, or actually morning, isn't it? Um, and uh, it's really nice to see an old uh, friend and colleague, Steve Yananak, on there. So, hi, Steve. Um, so uh, basically, um, I've been working on hemlock, I've been working on adelgids for a really long time. They've been a, a lifelong interest of mine is, in my career. And uh, working on the hemlock woolly adelgid is, uh, it's, you know, here it is, it looks like it's a pretty ugly looking bug, but it's never a dull moment, let me reassure you. Um, so uh, let me see, how can I, what am I doing here? What am I doing wrong? I can't, I'm stuck. Oh, you should be able. Oh, there you go. Okay, Good. there we go. Okay, so um, this is uh, this is the bug on the twigs, and it feeds on the twig tissue. I just want to make sure people realize that it's a aphid-like thing, uh, just basically a beach ball with uh, uh, straw-like mouth parts, and they insert their mouth parts into the twig tissue, feeding on the uh, xylem ray parenchyma cells. They don't feed on the needles; they feed on the twig, and that's really important. Um, so. The worldwide distribution of HWA, uh, um, thanks to Nathan Havel here, this is, he's looked at the genetics of the different populations. So there's two distinct populations in China, two in Japan, 
and uh, there's one in the Pacific Northwest. These are all native populations. We used to think, and the literature states that uh, the population in the Northwest was introduced at some point in time. That's definitely not the case, especially considering the fact that there is a whole suite of natural enemies associated with uh, HWA in the Pacific Northwest. Interestingly enough, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and I, we didn't even consider HWA as a, as a potential problem. Um, then when I moved back east, uh, uh, it, it uh, <laughs> became very apparent to me that it's indeed a big problem. And uh, Nathan's work has shown that the uh, biotype that we have of the HWA actually comes from southern Japan. Um, so the story of it spread in north or in uh, eastern U.S. Actually, in uh, eastern North America, I can say now. Um, basically, it was first introduced in the early 1900s uh, in the Richmond, Virginia area, uh, very likely on nursery stock from southern Japan. And uh, Nathan feels like he has he's nailed down the exact uh, uh, arboretum where it came into. Um, the literature often states that uh, the, it came in the mid 50s. Actually, that's when the first um, sample was placed in the National Museum from Richmond. So uh, that's, that's where that date comes from. It was actually introduced far earlier. Um, so um, since that time, it spread uh, rapidly uh, up and down the coast. Basically, it got into, it sort of flopped around for a while in the, in the coastal plains there in the Richmond area. And then as soon as it got into the hemlock forests of the Appalachians, um, it started to move uh, very rapidly in the south. Uh, it's just, uh, it was actually very I should say very, it very rapidly caused a ton of mortality in the south and then it's been moving north. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, I think is important when we're considering the biological control um, is that uh, as it moves north, it actually moves much more slowly. And I'll, I'll talk about that um, in a, few, a little bit later here. So here's a thank you, Tom McAvoy, for this beautiful map, which is very recent um, of the distribution, not only uh, of, uh, of Suga canadensis in all of North America, including Canada, um, but also the most recent find of hemlock lily delgid in uh, southwestern Nova Scotia. Um, that's uh, it's been there probably I'd say at least ten years, and there's a lot of mortality. Um, so uh, you can see it's it's really um, and then of course I can't ignore the population way out there in Michigan on the coast. So it's spreading. Um, it hasn't encompassed the whole distribution, and so of hemlock Hemlock. So I mean, we're, we sort of have time up here in the north, I think, uh, because it's, of its rather slow movement. But I don't know how that's going to play out uh, as time goes on. Um, this is the life cycle of HWA in North America. Uh, we only have the secondary host, uh, the population on the secondary host on hemlock. Even where we have uh, a native population in the Pacific Northwest, we have yet to find the uh, the sexual generation on spruce. In uh, Japan, it's on uh, Picea polita, uh, and um, it's uh, it's not very common there, according to people who have been looking for it out there. And indeed, I have a Picea Polita just uh, right around the corner from my office here and I've been looking at the dang thing for a long time and I have yet to see any uh, uh, galls on it uh, from the sexual generation. So in the, in the uh, East Coast and North America we only have the secondary host on hemlock and there are two generations a year on that host. Um, so this is another way to look at the life cycle. Um, if you look, let me see, you got my pointer there? Yes. Uh, in the summertime, it, it, when all the predators are out, it's this little tiny black dot, which is really great. Um, in the wintertime, it begins to grow perhaps in October, um, begins to fatten up, getting bigger and bigger. It looks like this in the upper right-hand corner, probably around January, or February, of course, taking advantage of warm spells to put growth on. And then right around March, uh, middle of March, we get uh, eggs coming out of the cistins generation. The cistins uh, eggs hatch into the progridians, and then they turn into this little teeny tiny crawler here. That's the only dispersal stage for this insect. The crawler then is blown by the wind, uh, is, uh, is taken phoretically on birds or perhaps on the hair of a squirrel or something.
in and settles, finds a place to settle down, inserts its mouth parts, and then it doesn't move from that point on. The progridians generation then grows throughout springtime, and then in June, this progridians eggs hatch into the cisterns. They, the uh, a cisterns of crawlers find a place to settle down and turn into the estivating nymph, which is up here in the uh, upper left-hand corner. So two generations a year. Um, and uh, there's often, it, it's interesting that there is indeed a winged adult uh, uh, formed, um, and but it does not find any spruce. So that's a, a actually a density dependent reaction um, in the progridians generation. Um, so um, this is the, the uh, beauty herself. Um, you see the wax, the little pores on the dorsal surface for forming the wax, which protects it uh, in the, I think in the winter time, it's, uh, it's critical. It's, it's interesting, there are a few instances, we've been doing a lot of, of uh, uh, um, I just examination of winter, overwintering mortality and in twigs where we get everything dead, I mean, maybe we find one that's alive and that one is, is protected by bud scales to somehow protect so I think that wax is really important uh, for the winter survival. And if you look at the mouth parts here, uh, they actually, these are all taken, uh, these are all fallen apart here. There's actually four parts, maxillary and mandibulary, uh, but they, uh, they extend uh, way down uh, be below the slide and uh, into the tissue. Um, Okay, so the important thing I think is to consider the impact on the tree. So here you, in the right hand, up in the upper right hand corner, you see all those adelgids there. I like to think of this as the uh, um, the uh, voodoo doll model of feeding. So you consider each one of those adelgids has, stick, has put their mouth parts into that twig tissue, and uh, what it's research has shown that it actually uh, the tree in reaction to the feeding actually mobilizes uh, secondary chemicals, and those secondary chemicals. Uh, um, clog up the uh, conductive tissue. And uh, it isn't the needles that die first, it's actually the buds that die first. And this is, I think this is really important uh, when in for a number of aspects of the biology of the insect. Um, so basically, uh, we signed uh, trees dying within four to 10 years. Um, and I've found up here in New York that uh, trees in more music sites take much longer. I've seen some, some places where the trees have lasted 20 years, but other, other sites, um, it's been four years or, or even less. And on those sites, there are very thin soils, very droughty soils. And um, indeed, drought is oftentimes, I think a lot of, a lot of the people working on hemlock woolly adelgid think drought is, is a real uh, death knell to the trees that have been infested. Um, so there, this is what it looks like in an early infestation. You've already seen many slides of that, uh, this one twig. Um, this is really uh, 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 important to look at it because you get these with the first year that the trees are, are really infested it produces very uh, fat juicy and fecund uh, adelgids uh, whereas as time goes on, that twig, it doesn't produce very many new twigs here. You can see some in the background here out of focus, of course, I'm such a great photographer. Um, and uh, they, they go towards that new tissue, um, but on the old tissue, they don't produce very much. And then it's just a gradual downhill slope once the needles begin falling off, the buds have died, and this is a, a, a tree very close to uh, death. Um, so I'm put this up here, and this is not a hemlock woolly adelgid, um, but this is what we call the hemlock borer. Uh, and I found this to be a real uh, uh, gaining, uh, how would you say, this is an emerging problem in the hemlock forest in New York State. Uh, I haven't seen it a lot elsewhere, um, and my colleagues to the south uh, haven't really seen a lot of this, but here you see in these trees on the left-hand side, they still have green needles, but the uh, woodpeckers have shown us that the trees are actually chock-a-block full of the hemlock borer. So um, my question, I keep scratching my head and wondering, well, is this, is this hemlock borer all of a sudden becoming an aggressive, uh, maybe primary tree killer? Well, you know, the trees are weakened, but um, it's just something to, to keep in mind when you're, when you're thinking about hemlock woolly adelgid management in your forests. Um, so this is a, a picture of New York State and uh, why we are so concerned about hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, the, uh, uh, you can see, well, basically, uh, statistically, we have more hemlocks than any other state 
in the nation and coming from Washington state, I sort of was curious about that. But I, you, you look at the uh, hemlock in New York and it's really a very common tree. Indeed, it's the third most common stem in the state right behind red maple and sugar maple. So, and when, when you think about it, uh, you get all this huge density of almost pure hemlock stands in the uh, Southern Adirondacks and the Tug Hill Plateau. Um, and the hemlock woolly adelgid is not there yet. And so we're just, we're staring at that place and just sort of wondering, well, oh, I backtrack. We did find it there. Actually, David Orwig from Harvard uh, for us found it there this summer for us in the Adirondacks. And this was the real wake up call. But it's really interesting. He only found three trees that were, actually he found one tree that was infested. And the person that he was with from SUNY ESF in Syracuse, uh, he, he, he did a double take and said, we don't have hemlock woolly adelgid in the Adirondacks. Well, uh, hopefully we don't anymore because we jumped on it uh, with insecticide treatment to try and slow down the spread in that area where the hemlocks are so common. But here you see in New York State, we got it in the 80s uh, here in the Hudson Valley, and it sort of spreads uh, slowly and then in the 90s, it got in the, actually in the 90s, it finally got up into uh, um, the Finger Lakes and nursery stock into these area movement into uh, Buffalo and Rochester, but it's been spreading. And I think that the spread uh, is, it's not as rapid as it is in the south. And I think that's because of the cold winter temperatures that we have here uh, causing so much mortality. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so. What is the problem? Um, basically, it's asexual reproduction. All you need is one individual to start a new population. There's a relatively high reproductive potential, um, two gen generations a year, and I think conservatively maybe 5,000 potential progeny from one female in a year. And this is really important. Um, I've, you know, I've sort of been, I've been very surprised personally uh, at uh, some of my study sites where we get like over 90% mortality and then the next year is just there's just they're all over the place again they just pump they just pop right back it's it's really remarkable how fast that the populations expand uh, there are no uh, native natural enemies in the eastern United States and so that's I'm going to talk a lot about classic biocontrol and we have no documented resistance on eastern or Carolina hemlock but we are are looking uh, at stands, uh, the uh, researchers at the uh, University of Rhode Island have been going through the Pennsylvania area uh, looking for survivors, uh, trees that look good in the wake of uh, the advancing hemlock woolly adelgid populations. And indeed, uh, uh, researchers there also uh, have been looking at a stand uh, that apparently has avoided hemlock woolly adelgid uh, infestation in northern New Jersey. So stay tuned on the resistance front, um, but uh, right now, we have no exact documentation of that. So this is a kumbaya moment just to consider the ecological impact of this tree. I, I think of that, I, you know, there's something about hemlock besides, you know, all the, the intellectual uh, 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 jargon or uh, you know all the intellectual thought behind the ecological importance it's just it's a, something that just pulls at my heartstrings and I, I like to refer to it I think of it sort of like as the uh, Labrador puppy dog of, of the tree world it just does something for me but um, you know, I think that uh, one of the uh, impacts, ecological impacts that's really gained traction here in New York State is its uh, cooling effect on waterways and uh, trout fishing up here is a huge deal. And um, I think uh, people are becoming concerned that if they lose the hemlocks, uh, that might impact uh, the trout fisheries and the salmon fishery on Lake, um, on Lake Ontario. And of course, you know, the direct uh, cooling effects of the shade on the waterways are important. And it, but, you know, if you ever go into a stand of hemlock in the summertime during the heat of the summer, it's just, it's immediately you get a cool sensation. Uh, it's really remarkable how much cooler it is. But this is, I think, uh, the uh, how do you say the density across the landscape in a watershed I think is 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 really important for hemlock because the impacts on snow melt in the springtime are huge uh, when the well, the light penetrates a, a hardwood stand readily um, and, but it doesn't penetrate into the dense hemlock stands and so it retains uh, snow and ice for a much longer period of time so its contribution to a cooler uh, groundwater uh, I think can be significant in maintaining the cool water in the streams. Um, so considering what 
what are our options uh, for natural control of insect populations? Basically, it's an additive effect of host tree resistance, um, which is difficult to get to. Uh, uh, abiotic factors, temperature, I'm going to talk about that, and then biological controls. So, um, First of all, the, the temperatures. I've been studying this uh, for a number of years now in, in New York State and um, primarily at two study sites, Minekill State Park, where we have the, uh, a population in the coldest, the coldest population in New York State, and Taganic State Park, which is right near us here in Ithaca, which is sort of in the banana belt of the uh, uh, Lake Ontario Plain. Um, and uh, at those two sites, uh, just to, as an illustration, uh, Taganic State Park in uh, 2014, um, the, my, the lowest temperature was minus 22 Celsius, and we got 91% mortality. Whereas at Minekill State Park uh, that year, the lowest temperature was minus 30, and we got only 82% mortality. And so my initial reaction was, wow, you know, maybe we do actually have uh, uh, adaptation to colder temperatures. It's more ambiguous now with, uh, uh, now that we've looked at it for many years. Um, and, you know, it's like there's a lot going on with its response to temperature. This is uh, 1516, where we were plopping around at, at less than 20% uh, mortality until February, uh, actually Valentine's Day, uh, where we got the, a, a remarkable, uh, remarkably rapid decline in temperature down to about minus 22 degrees uh, Celsius and then we got we got mortality up to up above 95 percent um, and if you look at another year this is 1617 um, we uh, it's, we got temperatures down below minus 10 and very little mortality at all until very late in the year. And here you can see uh, late in the year, I, that wasn't included on that last graph, but we got a, uh, a cold snap that hit Minekill, which is the colder area, and we got a, a leap in mortality then. Um, but, but it didn't hit uh, uh, the gigantic very much. But here you can see also we got uh, um, in 1415, the huge uh, mortality event was actually in uh, early January. And in 1516, it was in February. So the mortality events, they shift throughout the season um, and they cannot, and sometimes it's not very severe. And as I said before, I've seen populations like after the uh, polar vortex, we basically had three years of over 90% mortality at Minekill State Park and and yet uh, the following season uh, 1617 we we got uh, uh, just an amazing population explosion I thought I was going to lose the study site because I'd already sampled every single bug that was there and sure enough they came back uh, like a like a train. Um, and I also want to uh, uh, emphasize the impact of cold temperatures on the Balsamolia delta. This is actually the bug that got me into the business um, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, my favorite uh, fir trees were being killed by the Balsamolia delta in the late uh, 70s. And um, I did a senior thesis on that uh, in undergraduate work and really um, was amazed at the uh, impact of this insect. And I tried to get money to work on it uh, and I, when I got into grad school at the University of Washington. And I was told in no uncertain terms that this would never be a problem because it would never get out of the coastal areas because it was sensitive to cold weather. Well. Um, just suffice it to say, it's causing huge mortality now in the uh, one of the coldest places in New York State, which is around Lake Placid. And I've even found it on fir trees uh, near the top of Mount Washington in, uh, in New Hampshire, which is pretty dang cold. I think they call it the coldest place in the, uh, the eastern United States, at least. So um, if the Balsamolia adelgid can adapt to cold temperatures. I am going to assume uh, that the hemlock lily adelgid can as well. And I think this is really important when you're considering uh, that we have the potential to lose a whole species of trees. And so conservation efforts, in my mind, should not just sit back uh, and wait for it to not adapt to cold temperatures. Uh, so that's why I think it's really important to move forward. Um, and so um, I think biological control really is the long-term answer for this insect. If you go to the uh, Pacific Northwest and look at the populations uh, in the Puget Sound where I have a really uh, 
uh, consider, and, and, and others as well, we really consider the populations of hemlock woolly adelgid to be uh, uh, controlled primarily by predators. It just has that feel of a predator-driven system. You know, perhaps resistance comes into play maybe uh, in higher elevations or in, in different areas, but in areas where we find hemlock woolly adelgid readily, it appears to be a, a predator-driven system. Um, as opposed to say the emerald ash borer, which really that is a resistance driven system in my mind. Although parasitoids are really important, I think when you've got to, to maintain low level populations. But the, con the approaches to biological control, uh, there's twofold. One is uh, to wild collect predators and then directly release them in the East Coast. And we've been doing this for a number of years uh, and um, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, the problem is, is that there's an inconsistent supply of predators. Uh, the availability fluctuates in wild native populations. And indeed, um, you go to a place in the Pacific Northwest and you collect for a few years and then the population collapses in that location. And so you have to set out and uh, find more uh, areas to go collect. And that's always a, uh, an important aspect of uh, collecting the predators out there is you always gotta go out and scout ahead of time and then know where you're going uh, to be efficient in collecting them uh, in fall. Um, Lab rearing, on the other hand, I think uh, in an insectary, is, it's a much more consistent supply of predators. It's scalable. You can uh, hire more people uh, and get more space and grow more bugs. It is relatively expensive, but um, at this point in time, I think that we really, uh, we can't mess around uh, with biological control of the hemlock woolly adelgid. The populations are moving. They're spreading throughout New York State. We have a huge resource here, um, and we really need to get as many bugs as possible out there uh, so that we can affect the biological control. You know, luckily we're building on the success of uh, of labs in Virginia, Georgia, and Tennessee. Um, but it, we're different up here. And I think, you know, we've got uh, many issues surrounding the uh, phenology of the adelgid and uh, controlling the phenology of the predators that we're rearing in the lab. And so it's, it's a complicated story. And as I like to say, anybody can grow fruit flies. These predators are, are really a tricky thing. So classic biological control has been actually uh, worked on in for hemlock woolly adelgid since the early 90s. Um, that's when the first, uh, uh, in the early 90s, the first bug brought over was the Sasagi skimnitsugi. Uh, then in uh, the mid 90s, uh, some skimnus uh, were brought, a couple of species of skimnus were brought from China. Um, and then in the late 90s, uh, Laracobius nigrinus was brought in from the Pacific Northwest, actually Vancouver Island. Um, and then in 2005, Lyricobius osakensis came from Southern Japan. And then in the uh, recently in 2008, uh, we began to work with Leucopus species from the Pacific Northwest. Um, so these are all the predator releases to date, sort of. I, I, I think I'm embarrassed. I think I've neglected to put some of my release sites in New York uh, into the database, but this gives you an idea of the concentration of effort down here in the south, which is quite right, uh, in the Great Smoky Mountains and such, where the populations of adelgids have just been moving so rapidly and tree mortality occurs uh, far more rapidly than in the north. But here you see also there's been a pretty big effort in the Delaware water gap uh, and uh, up here in Maryland uh, where my friend Biff has been working with others to get as many uh, predators released as possible. Um, so this is another map. I just love these maps. They're so pretty. Um, but anyway, um, there's a difference in the different uh, in the predators. Okay, so uh, there's spring summer feeders, and then there's the winter spring feeders. Uh, the spring summer feeders basically they prey on the pergidians eggs and nymphs, uh, as well as the cistern's eggs. So they they feed on the eggs of both generations, and these are the coccinellid beetles, uh, Sasagi skimnus and skimnus, um, as well as the chamomile fly Leucopus. Um, winter feeders, winter spring feeders, basically they prey on the cistern's nymphs 
throughout the winter and then lay their eggs and amongst the progridians eggs and the larvae develop in the progridians eggs and then uh, drop to the forest floor where they uh, pupate until emerging again in fall and that would be the Laracobia species that we've been working on. So this is just another uh, illustration of that relationship where you have the winter spring feeders emerging with the uh, adelgids in the fall and this is a uh, uh, a, a point of vulnerability with this when you're trying to rear the insects in the lab because if you don't have any prey available, if they say emerge earlier, then the adelgids begin developing, they don't have the prey available, and then you're, you're liable to lose a large portion of the popul of those that emerge earlier um, because they don't really survive very well on yeast, on artificial diet. So then you get the spring summer feeders, they begin uh, working on the eggs of the progridians and they feed on the eggs of the cystins. Okay. So Society Skimnitsugi, uh, the first one brought over, it's spring summer feeder. Uh, Mark McClure at the Connecticut Egg Experiment Station brought it back from Japan. Um, and the first releases commenced in the 90 in 95. Um, it's a relatively easy insect to rear. Uh, labs began rearing in New Jersey, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And to date, uh, in excess of 5 million have been released throughout the uh, East Coast. And here you, this is a map of the releases that have been made. Um, the uh, establishment, unfortunately, with this insect is uncertain. Um, there's many sites, especially in the north, uh, where they've been released and we really have seen very few uh, recoveries. I know I've been in the Delaware Water Gap uh, looking for Laracobius and uh, have never caught a, a, a Sasagi skimnus. Um, and so, um, at this point in time, I think, um, you know, for instance, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, over half a million were released since 2002, um, but a total of 614 adults and, and uh, larvae were recovered at only 13 sites. So um, basically, this is an insect that uh, um, researchers um, up and down um, the coast have really basically stopped working with. I, know, I think Pat Parkman in Tennessee is still growing a few Sasagi skimnus, um, and, uh, and you know, they, they might work in the south. I think it's, it's good to have as many uh, different predators out there as possible, plugging all potential niches. Um, skimnus species, I think they have great promise. They're also spring summer feeders. In 95, Mike Montgomery uh, found three unknown species in China and brought it back for evaluation. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they are uh, very abundant predators in China, um, and uh, they're, but they, um, they're the most abundant predators in China, whereas Laracobius is not. Laracobius is very abundant in Japan and the Pacific Northwest. And I'm gonna be talking about Laracobius shortly, but it's interesting why are skimness so important in China and not elsewhere? Um, so, uh, skimness ningshenensis, I got that there, and sinuod sinuan Sinuodulus, but I, I don't say those names enough, so I don't have them on the tip of my tongue. They were finally released in 2004 after testing, but in very limited numbers, and uh, no subsequent recoveries have been made. Um, it's sort of disappointing to me uh, that uh, we can't can't put more effort into this because I really think we need more spring summer feeders that are uh, effective. Uh, Skimnus camptodromus, another one of those species that Mike Montgomery brought back. Um, uh, was uh, actually uh, my friend uh, Melody Kina and um, my postdoc uh, uh, Samita Limbu. Um, really, they like this bug. They think it's it's really uh, uh, a good predator. But unfortunately, uh, just before the review was finished, they had one more aphid they tested on, uh, they lost the colony. And so going back to China and getting individuals to start another colony with is a huge effort. Um, but I think it's something that, that would, uh, in the long run, be an important step to take in uh, the biological control of Hemlock woolly adelgid. Skimnus coniferarum, this is native to the Pacific Northwest. Um, that's been brought over and released in North Carolina, um, not to any great degree as yet. Um, there is some concern amongst researchers because it is very prolificous on many adelgids, and so that might basically uh, water down its impact on Hemlock woolly adelgid. We don't really know. 
um, because recoveries uh, have not been uh, um, evaluated very thoroughly in the North Carolina area. Um, so Laracobius nigrinus is the insect that we've really, uh, biocontrol efforts have been focusing on for a long time. Um, they were first brought over in, uh, to the East Coast in 97 by Scott Salem and Lee Humble uh, from a uh, hemlock seed orchard uh, near Victoria, British Columbia. Um, the first releases were made in 2003 in the uh, Banner Elk, uh, North Carolina area. Um, and mass rearing has been successful. It's not the easiest thing in the world to, to rear but uh, they've been uh, we've been had successful efforts in Virginia Tennessee and Georgia and now up in New York and I, and I got to say today I just got a text from uh, one of my technicians and we have our first uh, Laracobius nigrinus that has dropped uh, down for pupation in our lab so that's a big step for us and I have hopes that we're going to be able to grow many more uh, for a future release. Uh, so Laracobius nigrinus, to date over 330 have been released throughout the eastern states um, from labs and, and wild collections. And remember, this is an insect that feeds during the winter time. Um, and um, I think that that's an important uh, aspect of its biology um, when you consider its successful population buildups. In North Carolina, uh, where uh, Thousands and thousands have been released uh, in, in the Banner Elk area in particular. Um, they found it, we found it uh, 30 miles away from the original release site. And indeed, uh, in 2013, uh, a bunch of us uh, went down there and collected. Um, and I came back to New York with 3,000 uh, adults and released them around New York. Um, uh, Dave Mazal's work shows that uh, the actually establishment is better in warmer areas. And I agree with that. Um, I have found establishment up here in New York to be spotty. Um, this is uh, our lab and Kate, uh, the technician actually just sent me the photo. Uh, so this is our lab in New York, uh, Cornell. These are the release sites here. You can see down in North Carolina, uh, this is the Banner Elk area here. And uh, it's been a lot of releases also here in the Delaware Water Gap, uh, Massachusetts and into, uh, um, I don't think that that's Negrinus up there in Maine, but um, anyway. So recoveries have been good in North Carolina um, and uh, amongst all the researchers over 12,000 were collected in 2013 uh, and, and dispersed to other areas. Um, recovery populations after the winters of 1314 and 1415 were low um, but now they're coming back again in North Carolina. Um, so that's a, that's a good sign of its establishment and spread. Um, one of the things that I learned when I was in North Carolina is this hedge right here. Um, this hedge, I went back to it every day for a week and I caught 200 adults every single day. And you know, it's, it's interesting because this hedge looks like it's sort of beat up. It's pruned sort of nicely. Um, and so the whole idea of releasing um, Laracobius in a wild forest, uh, where do they go? Well, they, they go where the prey is, up on the top of the tree. Um, and so if we are to release them on hedges in New York State, I'm thinking we could go back to those hedges and then spread them around. And so uh, the whole concept of, of planting hedges and growing uh, Laracobius on them is an idea I really like. And indeed, you can have the hedges spread across the landscape. So if there is any local adaptation to climate, uh, you'll have those uh, locally adapted insects. New York is a, is a big state. We have a lot of different climates. And so that concept, I think, is, is important here. Here you can see I actually found a source of some nice big trees and uh, the grower was nice enough and sold them to me at cost. And I didn't realize the cost of trucking would be so expensive. So luckily I had a a very nice uh, department chair and he put up with me for a little bit there uh, until I could get the grant money to pay for it. But anyway, I, I like the concept of hedges and the uh, for Laracobius nigrinus. Um, 
and also Laracobius osakensis. This is uh, another winter spring feeder uh, brought over from Japan in 2005. Um, and uh, research, uh, they brought it to Virginia Tech where they've been growing it and they still have a culture. And uh, thank you, uh, 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 Scott and Carrie, for sending up Laracobius osakensis to us up here in Ithaca, where we also have a little bit, uh, a little culture going now. Hopefully, we'll get a lot more. The interesting thing is that the research at Virginia tech uh, indicates that Osakensis might be more fecund and voracious than uh, Nigrinus. Um, they've been rearing it now at Virginia Tech in Tennessee and releases have started in 2012 and 62 releases to date with 32,000. So um, we uh, the sort of the the book has yet to be really written with this insect, but we have great hope uh, that it's going to be a successful predator. Um, so we've begun working now with another spring summer feeder and um, not a beetle, this is Leucopus. Uh, there's two species, Argenticollis and Pinnaperta from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, Daryl Ross and Kimberly Whalen and Glenn Kohler um, recognized that these were important predators uh, um, earlier and have been, um, one, have been working with this. And um, actually we, we got, I, they worked, I worked with them in uh, 2015. Uh, we had field sites up here in New York and a field site with Bud Mayfield down there in North Carolina. And uh, work with uh, Kyle Motley showed that uh, we got a st establishment at both locations. And so um, I've just, I got uh, field releases going up here in New York uh, in 2017, just this last spring at nine sites. And we got uh, establishment at all nine sites uh, with the F1 generation. So I'm very excited about that uh, because I think one of the problems that we're dealing with uh, with, um, with uh, Laracobius, um, and I should go, oh, where's that slide? It's in there, oh, I forgot, I lost my place. But basically one of the problems with Laracobius, I think in its establishment in the north, is the, are the, uh, uh, the events surrounding um, uh, the mortality of the hemlock, of the hemlock woolly adelgid. And uh, if you think about it, you have uh, a population, you're, you have a population of Laracobius feeding throughout the winter time, and all of a sudden uh, you lose 90% or more of, of the prey. And I really can't help but think that that impacts the population buildup. Actually, I'm working with some modelers here in my department. We're trying to, to build a model of population development given these mortality events. And I think it also depends on when that mortality event occurs. And if you remember that slide where I had the mortality occurring in January and in February and in March, um, if that mortality I think occurs in January and February, um, those developing Laracobius, uh, those adults that are developing their ovaries, um, wouldn't really, perhaps may not have enough food to lay a full complement of eggs, whereas perhaps if the mortality is in late March, uh, like last year, um, they would have had enough food to lay a full complement of eggs. So there's a, a big question in my mind about uh, the cold adaptation of Laracobius as well as the impact of the hemlock woolly adelgid mortality on population buildup. And that's one of the reasons I'm really um, focusing on spring summer feeders. That's why I'd love to get some of the skimness over. And that's why I'm so uh, I'm interested in working with Leucopus. So here's a picture of the egg uh, in amongst the hemlock woolly adelgid eggs. Um, this is a picture of the larvae, uh, the final instar larva feeding on the hemlock woolly adelgid eggs. And here's the pupa and a newly emerged adult. So these are all photos that we took from material um, I collected in the Pacific Northwest last spring. Um, so the process that we've been going through um, is that we collect uh, material uh, branches of uh, Western hemlock and we ship it out to the quarantine facility at Cornell. And uh, that's because I definitely don't want to introduce the Western strain of hemlock woolly adelgid here on the East Coast. Um, the reason 
I don't want to uh, invest in rearing them in the West Coast is that for some reason there's a heavy amount of mortality within just a very few days um, uh, of the of the adults as they emerge. Um, and so uh, actually we did a little study and we found that we lost over 60% of our of the adults uh, that had merged after just three days. Um, interestingly enough, those that survived beyond three days uh, uh, lived for at least a week and a half. So this is something we're going to continue to look at, but uh, having the, the quarantine facility here at Cornell has made a big difference in our capacity to rear quantities of uh, leucopus. Here we are, happy people in the lab with a shipment of uh, material from the West Coast. We put them into plexiglass cages. Remember how small that uh, crawler is? Well, at first I, I brought it out and I put them in. I, when, I, when I first did this, I brought uh, material out and we put them into bug dorms with that uh, normal uh, um, mesh on them. And after the first day, we got flies emerging, but I looked down uh, and the crawlers were just zooming right through the mesh. And so we immediately um, uh, destroyed the material and went to plexiglass cages with 120 micron mesh on them. And that's sufficient to contain the crawlers and uh, it works very well. And uh, this year we're basically doubling our capacity for production. Last year, uh, I think we got about uh, almost 4,500 leucopus adults from about 80 pounds of uh, branches that we shipped back. And interestingly enough, we got two emergence peaks. So, uh, and indeed, the first time I shipped it out, it was uh, at the beginning, at the you know, towards the end of uh, April. And um, so there, they were beginning to emerge then. So. Perhaps there's two generations here, maybe even three. I don't really know. Um, we have yet to really uh, do the phenology study on that. Here's the a picture of the flies in a cage there uh, with some yeast. Um, and this is the way we have been releasing them in bags uh, affixed to the branches uh, that are infested. Um, I did release some earlier in 2015, just uh, it's sort of opening up the jar and saying, well, there you go, have fun. And that uh, didn't really feel good to me. I like the bags here because then we can uh, sub we can sample the, uh, um, the the twigs after we take the bag off and see whether or not they became established. So what we do is we leave the bags on for about three weeks until um, the uh, F1 generation has become established. Then we take the bags off so that generation can then uh, develop and then fly away um, at, at their will. Um, oh, here's the, here's my, some, here's my uh, uh, temperature, uh, the mortality graph here. You can see, I think that when you get the mortality events earlier in the year, you're going to uh, impact the uh, Laracobius populations more heavily than when the mortality events occur later on in the season. Um, so, this is, uh, uh, again, I think the, uh, the winter spring uh, uh, predators, I think, probably are more successful in the south, uh, not because they are more cold tolerant, but also because uh, the uh, mortality event of prey in the north. And the spring summer, I have great hopes uh, of perhaps more of these becoming established uh, in the north um, in New York State. So. Um, in the meantime, I, I think it's really important to uh, utilize uh, the systemic insecticides to keep the trees alive. Um, I, I think that without these, we would not have hemlocks in some of our most uh, uh, most cherished state parks here in New York State. And I know that uh, down in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, it's the same way. Um, it's just a tragedy to lose um, our trees uh, if we have these tools available. And the cool thing is that they're very inexpensive um, and they are environmentally benign. Uh, the, we, in New York State, we apply them uh, with a basal bark spray, a tank mix of both imidacloprid and dinotefuran. The dinotefuran is for a quick takedown of the populations, so we, they don't get, uh, uh, hopefully we'll keep them from reproducing. And then the imidacloprid uh, is slow to move into the tree, but it has a lasting effect of, of many years. And so we've actually used this technique in New York State uh, a couple of times. This is uh, Zor Valley in the uh, western New York. Uh, it's an amazingly beautiful uh, uh, canyon cut down through uh, glacial deposits on top of rock. And we have a, in the south 
part here. This is a 400 acre um, nature preserve. It's almost all old growth hemlock. We found it here in September and looked around and we couldn't find any more infested trees. And it was sort of a miracle. It was just on this one tree right here. And of course it was on the branches right next to the water. Um, and uh, there here is the, uh, the bird theory comes into mind as the birds being responsible for long distance uh, dispersal. So uh, we convinced uh, the state to jump in there and uh, treat a buffer around uh, those, that infested tree. Uh, at the time they were treating, uh, they got done so fast with those 400 trees uh, that um, they went across the creek, uh, which I wasn't able to do before because the water was high. And um, they found another two small trees, so they treated all around those. So that was in 2014, and we've been back every year since uh, using um, the uh, Velcro balls on squash, squash balls, Velcro on squash balls, which are very sensitive technique uh, to sample canopies. And we have yet to find any indication of hemlock woolly adelgid there. Um, and this is the exact same treatment uh, that we used in the Adirondacks around those three trees on Prospect Mountain that uh, David Orwig was nice enough to find for us. So hopefully uh, using these insecticides we can slow down population growth uh, in very uh, in very valuable areas like the state parks, but also to keep them from spreading into areas where we don't really have any populations yet. And hopefully we'll be able to get uh, the biocontrols uh, developed to the point that they will be effective by the time the hemlock woolly adelgid gets into um, these very valuable areas like the Adirondacks uh, and other very valuable stands across the state. So here's a quick plug for our organization uh, in New York that we have developed uh, based at Cornell. Basically, I, I think it's really important to have the outreach and, uh, co and coordination of volunteers um, and professionals across the state as an important part of uh, the management of the hemlocks and the hemlock woolly adelgid as well as having the biocontrol program. I, I'm not just gonna have a program that grows bugs and releases them without having uh, a bunch of uh, engaged uh, 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 constituents across the state and all, um, out there trying to save the hemlock trees. So our website is nyshemlockinitiative.info. We have a lot of stuff on there if you're at all interested. Um, and here's the uh, pretty little picture uh, uh, of, of one of my favorite little streams in the, in the Catskills. Um, and then this is my favorite goofy slide. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll go back to the nice one. So I guess uh, I'll take questions. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I consider myself much more uh, enlightened about hemlock woolly adelgid. Now, that was, that was great, I especially like the pictures. That's always helpful. Um, kind of visual learner, I guess. We, have, we have one question uh, from Kathleen Sexton. She says, is there any association with the use of Im imidacloprid and bee mortality? Um, that's a good question, uh, and I'm glad you asked it. You know, basically hemlocks are a wind-pollinated species, um, and uh, they have no nectaries. Uh, on them and bees, uh, when they use plants, they, they I think 75% of their diet is nectar produced by the plants. Um, and indeed, you know, that's a question I ask all my bee, uh, my colleagues who study bees and it's, it's unequivocal, even with ash, uh, they just don't find any use of hemlock pollen or ash pollen. Um, so uh, I feel very comfortable uh, using imidacloprid uh, the, and dinotefuran on the hemlocks. And, and indeed, you know, so there's another thought, so what are we looking at? Uh, you know, saving a species of trees is a pretty important thing, especially the ecologically important uh, hemlock species, foundation species. You know, you think about the uh, ecological importance, I, it's, it's really important to to think about it, we call it a foundation species because basically it provides the foundation upon which uh, a myriad of other species depend on for their life. And uh, you take ash out of an ash for, out of a hardwood forest, you still have a hardwood forest. If you take hemlock out of a hemlock forest, it's a whole game. It's a game changer. It's a totally different thing. Um, and um, so, I hope that sufficiently answered your question. Thank you, Mark. Um, she says it was a great explanation. Thank you. We have another um, question from Pam Melton. 
maps were great. Looks as if there is a sweep going on from New York toward the southwest. Is there a reason it is avoiding the coast or is that because of low hemlock numbers there? Oh, oh the coast of... Oh, the coast of North America, uh, of the East Coast. Yeah, it's because there isn't very much hemlock. Uh, the hemlocks are primarily in the mountainous areas of the uh, uh, Appalachians and then uh, um, up and through New York. And it comes down to the coast when you get further into uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and then you know right on the coast all the way up into uh, Nova Scotia. Okay. Um, I... I have another one here. How long can a crawler remain alive slash active once dislodged from a limb via wind or other vectors? That's a great question, and I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't imagine it's very long, um, but I really have not measured it, and I can't recall uh, any reference to that in the literature but uh, doesn't my memory uh, basically uh, doesn't work that well uh, all the time and I can't recall. Okay. We, that is, seems to be the last question at this point. Uh, oh, I'm wrong. When you find isolated infestations of one or two trees, is there a recommendation for how many of the surrounding trees to treat with insecticides? Uh, that's a really good question and something we've pondered uh, because that is the response that we are taking here in New York. Um, and hopefully, you know, we're going to keep it just one or two trees, which I really doubt um, because we just, we need to get more detection effort out there. Um, you know, my, my whole thing is to treat as many as possible. Um, and we've been limited by uh, the um, by the cost um, and also uh, by the uh, number of trees that can be treated uh, per acre. And um, I forgot how many we just treated this summer in the Adirondacks, but basically I think we did, we tried to do a 200 meter um, distance. We're going to go further this spring. Um, we were limited by the, uh, the acreage. And uh, I, the Adirondacks are just so important. And that, that population um, is just, it's 45 miles from the nearest uh, detection. And so we're really anxious to be sure that thing does not uh, get out of hand. So we'll go back and treat again this summer. I, I think that yeah, I'm not gonna be very happy until we get a good portion of the, the trees within a quarter of a mile of that treated. Okay, um, do you have general thoughts on trunk injections? Uh, yes, I do. I don't really like them because number one, they uh, take time, uh, a lot more time than the basal bark application, which basically is you spray, uh, um, you spray the trunk of the tree basically for the, the bottom five foot of the tree until it gets just to the point where the product is, is going to drip off of it and then you stop. And it's much more rapid to do the basal bark spray than the injection, plus you're you're putting a hole in the tree, which is something that I never like to do, even though I, you know, many arborist friends of mine swear up and down that it never hurts the tree. Um, and, uh, and then there's also the potential problems with what we call candy striping, where you inject it and the, the product moves up vertically on the tree readily, but it doesn't move laterally. And so it might, you might miss some of the branches. And so you would still have some of the population of adelgids harbored on those branches that get missed uh, by the product as it spreads throughout the canopy of the tree. Um, and, and also at this point in time, I just got a question the other day from a, a local arborist about using uh, mineral oils or, or other topical uh, insecticides like pyrethroids. And I really don't like those at all because um, you got to spray way up in the tree, you get all this drift. And um, I think the impact on non-target organisms is just far greater than when you do a, when you use a systemic insecticide. Um, any more questions? She says, thank you. Um, I am not seeing any more at this time. Um, 
I have one comment. I have one comment. I'm sorry, I forgot something I wanted to say. Um, you know, it's interesting when uh, there has one of the controversies in the biocontrol uh, has been the uh, hybridization of Laracobius uh, nigrinus with a native Laracobius that feeds on the pine bark adelgid, which is a native insect. And um, that has a uh, been of concern to some people in the release of the uh, uh, of Laracobius nigrinus, um, but work has shown, I think there's a few studies out there now that have shown that actually, for, it's interesting that the hybridization rate only it sort of like stops at about 10%. Um, and it's seen, you know, it's seen no shift any further than that in the hybridization. So um, I just, just wanted to say that uh, to get that information out there in case anybody hears about that hybridization and um, has that information at hand. Thanks, Mark. Um, folks, you see he has, has his email address there at the bottom of the slide. Um, so in case you think of something after our presentation, there's where you can get your information. Um, I want to thank you again, Mark. This has been great. We really appreciate you taking the time to do the presentation about what's going on. It's good for all of us to know more about these invasive pests. And, uh, I, and I hope you all have uh, learned a lot too on the, as, as my, our participants here in Emerald Ashbor University. And um, check out the emeraldashbor.info website uh, EAB University page and for the other webinars coming up. So with that, I am going to um, close.